Welcome to the Promised Land Youth Conference. This first series is entitled The Evidence of Bible Truth, and it follows the story of biblical archaeology. It was developed following the Bible Lands expedition that we were fortunate enough to participate in. That was led by Dr. Lane Rittmeyer and Dr. Stephen Collins. Much of the material must be credited to Brother Lane, including the illustrations and the content. We've just simply tried to capture and illustrate that experience and share it with you. We will be visiting, God willing, many of the same places that you're going to see in these presentations. And we hope that they will give you a taste of what you can expect when we get there. We hope that this primary, preliminary uh, study will help illustrate so that you can understand and the experience will be more profitable to you. Our first class is a place we're actually not going to go. It's the story of Sodom, the narrative from the Bible and the evidence that Dr. Stephen Collins has found in Jordan. It's an incredible story. We didn't want to miss it off, even though we're not going to go there, because it clearly demonstrates the evidence of Bible truth. It takes place, of course, beginning way back in the time of Abraham, and uh, it's amazing information that really illustrates how true the Bible is. This class was initially given as part of a study day in Canada. We're going to look at the example, or in sample as it's put there, of the city of Sodom, which we're told is an example to all those who would live ungodly. And um, before we left for Israel, we were given an itinerary and we were told what we were supposed to do. And uh, what it was was to be a field trip pretty much into the Bible. So we're going to use our Bibles during these classes, but we're going to have a lot of pictures and some video, hopefully, to share with you. And one of the things that we were told is to, to bring a, a pair of shoes and uh, prepare to get dirty because um, it's going to be quite the trek. And in fact, Sister Charlene and I, um, somebody suggested to me, I was a little bit heavier at the time, and they suggested I might want to shed a few pounds before we went to the land of Israel. And I was very thankful for that suggestion because um, it certainly was helpful, although what they didn't tell me was, you know, we walked about six kilometers a night in preparation um, for this, but Brantford is a little different than even here. It's, it's completely flat, so there was no hills. And uh, so we were just walking in the straight flatlands, and then when we got there, of course, everything's uphill both ways. So um, it was quite something else. So, but one of the things that we really want to drive home um, as we go through these studies together this, this weekend is that the words of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter says there that we made, um, well, he, he pre let's look it up and look at the actual passage, 2, 2 Peter chapter 1. He goes through and he's giving the evidence, he's telling the, the, the ecclesia there that they were, they were with the Lord Jesus Christ in the mount and they were eyewitnesses of what had taken place. So he tells them there that um, in, if you just come back into uh, verse 16, he says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so he says, look, this isn't a bunch of made-up stories. This is reality. And we were there, and we were, we were with him in the Holy Mount, and we, we heard that voice. And he goes on to talk about the more sure word of prophecy that we have. So, but that's the, the key issue, is that these are not a bunch of stories. Now, many of us grow up, and we, we hear the Sunday school stories of Abraham, of Lot, and Sodom, and, and ones like that we're going to consider, and, and of the different kings. And these are the things that we grow up learning all about. And mom and dad tell them to us, our Sunday school teachers read them to us. But when you go to school, or you go to work, and you talk with your neighbors, what you find out pretty quickly is that a lot of people think that this is just a bunch of myths and fairy tales. And um, God gives us, though, evidence to show us that that is not the case. And so we'd like to turn in our Bibles to the record, the, the story that we read together quite often. That's Genesis chapter 13. So if you just open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 13, this is the, the, one of the texts that really gives us a little bit of background. It's the story of Lot as he separates from Abraham. Remember, they come in chapter 12 out of the land of Ur of Chaldees together. They've gone down into Egypt for a little period of time, and then they come up out of Egypt, and in Genesis chapter 13, we have the situation where Abraham comes up. Now, this is a Bedouin tent, uh, still in use in Jordan today, a little bit different, perhaps, than, than Abraham's. I don't know if you can spot the difference, 
and that is that over here there's a, there's a satellite dish because there's a, a 60 inch uh, plasma TV inside this Bedouin tent. And what they actually do is they, they have little alligator clips and they, they clip onto the, the power grid and they hijack the power off the power grid and so they usually set their tents up somewhere where there's power so they can still get their satellite TV. But nonetheless, other than that, that tent is pretty much the same kind of tent that Abraham would have dwelled in. So in Genesis chapter 13, verse 1, Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him, into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and gold, and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, or Bethel as it's called in the land, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. We call it Ai, it's actually pronounced Ai unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called upon the name of Yahweh. So here we have the situation in the very beginning of this whole story where they've come back from Egypt and they've got a lot of stuff and that becomes a problem. And quite often that's the way it is with us. The more we, we get stuff, the more it weighs us down on our walk towards the kingdom. And this creates a problem uh, for Abraham and for Lot, his nephew. So we read in Genesis chapter 13, verse 5, Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. So you got all this stuff, and you got nowhere to put it, and there's not enough pasture land for the, the two different sets of uh, shepherding um, servants, and so what happens is there ends up being a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And of course, there's a, there's a solution that is provided by Abraham, and he says, look, you pick whatever you want, um, but really, like, um, he put his trust in God, that God would bless him. You know, you, you look back at that, and you think, really, what should they have done? Maybe they should have got rid of some of their stuff. And maybe Lot should have realized that the best thing to do would be, you know, send some of it away. Uh, ditch some of it along the road and, and stay with Abraham, his spiritual father. But of course, um, what ends up happening is, is that they decide to go their separate ways. So we read in Genesis 13, verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zohar. Now, one of the things that um, Dr. Collins, um, who we're going to meet shortly, pointed out is that the word here for plain in the Hebrew is the word kikar. And it really means something that is round, as in a round loaf of bread, the leavened bread, or a shekel, a coin. That's the idea of what the word is. So a pita bread, as we would know it today, uh, is round. That would be a kikar. And so would a coin be. So that's what this word means. So there's this round area of Jordan. And he read that, and he was sort of like, well, this is interesting, because they are at the time, um, Lane and, and um, Dr. Collins were in, were in I, and they were doing some excavations, and they were working there, and they were reading the Bible text, and um, they looked out and they said, well, if Sodom is at the bottom of the Dead Sea, or the south end of the Dead Sea, which is where um, one of the previous archaeologists, a man named Albright, had said that it was, how is it that Lot was able to stand here and see it? Because the problem is, this is the, the Jordan Valley here, you can see the Yarden as it's called, the Jordan, it goes into the Dead Sea, and um, if, if he's in Ai, um, this is the Kikar, this is the, the disc-shaped area, the flatland at the bottom of the Jordan River, uh, just before it empties into the Dead Sea. And uh, so Collins is going to tell us how that the scholars missed this. Now we've got several clips of video as we go through this, because to me I can tell you the story, but it's somewhat better to have it come from the horse's mouth himself. So this is Dr. Collins. He is an archaeologist who's worked with Lane for the last 30-some years. Um, he is a Christian, and um, he works out of Trinity Western, I think it's called, University in, uh, in the States. And so what we're able to tell the scholars now is, okay, you guys, I know you guys don't respect the Bible. You guys have dissed the Bible most of your careers. But because you didn't follow the biblical text, 
you have interpreted the Bronze Age in this region in a mistaken manner. If you had followed the biblical text, if you'd taken the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, literally, you would have found these cities a long time ago, and your understanding of the Bronze Age in this region would be light years ahead of where it is now. So, since you guys missed it, we followed the Bible, we found it, now you guys are going to have to play catch up, because now we're going to tell you what the region looks like. So his point was is that the scholars for all these years have missed it. And what they criticized him for is taking the Bible too literally. You know, when, when it says that, you know, Lot lift up his eyes from I and he saw the city of Sodom, we well, can't really take that literally, Dr. Collins. So um, he did take it literally and said, well, if that's what the Bible says, then we should be able to see the city from I, from AI as we would call it today. So this is just a, a map that gives you an idea of what this area would look like. And uh, coming right into the Middle East area, the, the Rift Valley, of course, which the Jordan Valley is part of, comes right up from Africa. You can see the Dead Sea at the bottom there. And it comes up to the Kikar of Jordan, or the, the circular disk. And as we kind of rotate around, you'll see how the, basically there's mountains all around it, but it's, it's a bit of a plain here in the middle. There's Ai, and there's Bethel there. And this is where Lot was. And the vantage point from here, you can see in this area, but there's mountains all along the side here that you can't actually see the Dead Sea from. So if he was standing there on, on the mountain by eye and looking out to this area, Jericho we just passed, over on the very far distant edge of it, there's six or seven, or actually there's about 13, of what they call um, Middle Bronze Age tells, or mounds, that are, he'll t explain to us later on. Um, there's Tel Tanu there. This is the main one um, that is Tel Al Hamam, which uh, has been identified as Sodom, and we'll look at the evidence for that. This is Tel Tanu, um, which is, again is a Middle Bronze Age city. And then there's Tel Rama that sits out just a little bit from this, and they still sit there today. There's buildings all around them, but these are archaeological sites in Jordan. Um, Tel Kephraim, who he believes uh, possibly is Gomorrah. And then there's Tel Barakat, Tel Tahuna up to the left there as well. So this is the, the area of Sodom, just sort of to give you an idea from a, from a bird's eye view. Well, this is where they headed off to, um, and he figured, well, if you had to see it from Ai, then the biggest of the Middle Bronze Age cities in that area should be Sodom, because it was head over those cities. Whenever the Bible lists off a series of cities, it usually begins with the largest one, and that's the head of the cities, and of course Sodom is with King Bera. So this is uh, Dr. Collins, and we're standing right on the mound of Tel al Hamam, and he's explaining the geography of the land and, and the lay of the land. This is where the rubber hits the road. I stood here with Lane Rittmeyer a couple of years ago when he first came over to start working on our drawings. He'd never been here before. And uh, we told the story of Genesis 13 from here and his jaw just dropped. He just said, I had no idea. I had no idea. From that point on, He's been doing a lot of talk about Sodom. <laughs> he sure has. All right, let's follow the geography. Where are we? What are we looking at? We're looking at the well-watered circle of the Jordan Valley. Now you see this little spur that comes down. <clears throat> that separates the Adma Zeboim doublet from this kingdom. Okay, two different groups because they have a just as discreet a piece of geography on that side as the kingdom of Sodom has on this side. Okay, very discreet, discreet geography. Now, when King Bera stood in his palace and looked over his kingdom, he could see it all. He could see it all because it borders, starts right there in the hills. The southern border goes all the way to those hills over there because the mound, you see where the, uh, the in the distance there where the Dust is coming up from the factory, from the gravel factory, all right? But just to the right, there's a mound. You see the little minaret on the right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> That's Talik Tanu. It has the same profile as this. Went down at the same time. It's a satellite. 
if you stand there and put your, if you stand right where I am or right where you are, if you put your hand there and put your hand there, you see Kefrine. So at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, Talakhtanu, tell Kefrine. See the bump? Yep. Okay. If you just bring your hands together exactly, there's a mound straight ahead. Tell Rama. Okay? So city, equidistant. City, equidistant. City. This is the main trade route. The main trade route comes down from the King's Highway, passes by Tal Hamam, goes straight across the Jordan. That's the direction Joshua went. And they camped here before they went over. All right? <clears throat> now. If you'll look about, if you'll make Jericho 12 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, Jerusalem. Okay? At 10 o'clock, Bethlehem. About 9 o'clock, Hebron. <coughs> okay, so now come back to Jericho. At 1 o'clock, about 1.30, <laughs> about half. Between 1 and... Two o'clock, the highest hill you can see. In fact, you can see it here. The highest hill you can see through the haze. That's Bethel and I. <coughs> you can take a picture from there and see Hamam. On a clear day, you can see it with your naked eye. So that's him standing on the site explaining how that from that vantage point, those are all the cities of the plain that Lot would have seen, and it is the major city, and from there, King Bera would have been able to look out and would have been able to see all the different cities of the plain of Sodom. Well, obviously, not convinced yet. So let's take a look at, um, this is the vantage point from Mount Nebo. We were able to climb up there, and you can actually see the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Here it is right in this area here, or Sodom this is. It's about a kilometer long, a thousand meters, and there are two tells, which are raised areas, and um, they, they cover about a thousand meters. This is what it looks like uh, in a geographical um, or a uh, relief map. And so you can see basically there's a, there's a rampart that they've excavated all the way around the outside. When they dug this up, uh, they found a temple complex down the bottom, a big gate complex here, a palace up the top, and, and other things all the way around. So that's the, the area that we're, we're looking at. And we're going to start, we, we hiked up the bus park somewhere back here. We hiked up the back side of it. And um, this is the excavation of the Tel Al Hammam uh, ramparts. And um, you can see that little area that's been indicated. Um, this is the area where really they began. Because once they could figure out what the area was, like if you could find a gate or some kind of a triangulation point, um, they knew that the palace would be either on this side or that side because obviously the king is going to take the best real estate and the best view. So they started excavating here and they found this mud brick wall. Now mud brick dates back to the time of the Middle Bronze Age. And uh, just so you know what they're talking about, this kind of puts it parallel with what we would understand. Um, Abraham is around the year 2000 uh, BC. So that is the time period um, of the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age. And um, then you've got Jacob living in that time period. Moses is at the end of it. And by the time you come to King David, that's what they call the Iron Age. And um, the Bronze Age era, um, they didn't have iron tools to carve rocks and, and so on and so forth. So what they did was they made a lot of their rocks out of mud brick. <laughs> And uh, here is the mud brick here. This is from the site of Sodom. And you can actually see these bricks are 3,500 years old to 4,000 years old. And they're all buried under the ground. Now, for the untrained eye like me, when we got there and we saw this, I'm just like, mm, you know, looks like a pile of rocks. And that's pretty much what it is because you have to dig down. So they would dig down, and here they are uncovering one of the ramparts. In fact, um, Dr. Collins gave me this slide to sort of show this is the, the Middle Bronze Age rampart in the middle area there. And um, there's Iron Age city walls that are built up and over top of it roundabout. And this goes all the way around this entire city. So the whole kilometer is rounded or circled by this uh, Bronze Age rampart. 
So this is the, the area, and we think of that psalm, you know, walk about Jerusalem, tell her towers, mark well her bulwarks. Well, this is the ramparts and the towers that would circle a city for defensive means. So there's the archaeologist digging away, and this is the upper city. And throughout all this area here, they dig these squares. They're about six meters by six meters that they dig down. And they're going down many, many layers to try and find the Middle Bronze Age area, because this area had already been identified as a historical site. It's uh, what was known in the, the New Ta or the Old Testament times as Abel Shittim, the city of the acacia trees, one of Solomon's supply cities from where they supplied the kingdom. Over in would have been the tribe of, um, I believe it would have been, uh, uh, I can't remember now, I think it's Reuben in the north. Um, but anyway, these are the houses that would have been in that area. And you can see as they dig down in these squares, you get down, this is the Iron Age rock that's on the top. Um, but down to the bottom is the Middle Bronze Age stratum that you can see that's being outlined there at the very bottom of this. So they would dig through this. And uh, these are some of the photos from that, that season dig, 2010 this is. And you can see that there's uh, the mud brick layers there, which we'll show you the side profile of. And then there's um, a rebuild on top of an early Bronze Age house around the year 6000 BC. Or sorry, 3000 BC. So it's around 5000 years old. How do they know that? Well, what they do is they use pottery to date it. And for me, pottery was one of those things that, you know, didn't really go high on my radar until this trip. In fact, my wife Charlene and I, we would drive along and you'd see like, you know, pottery studio. And she'd be pointing at, oh look, there's a pottery studio. And somehow gravity grabbed my foot and pulled it closer to the accelerator. And we'd go quicker by one of these things. But um, this is how they did it. Because if you thought about, you know, if we were to take in one of the old farms around here and you were to dig it up, and somebody would say, well, this is actually an ancient Native American settlement, you know? And you oh, really? That's really neat. And you start digging down, you dig down, you dig down, you get right down to the very bottom, and you uncover some Tupperware. Pretty much you know, no, this is not ancient Native American. This is like 1970s, 60s, somewhere around about there. And we could tell within a, a pretty clear time period what it was. Um, well, the same is true back then. They knew what the different pottery was at different times because of the technology of creating it. So whether there was a pottery wheel that was used, how it was fired in a kiln, the different things they can tell. So this is when all of a sudden pottery became very interesting. So here we are walking amongst the ruins. We were there in the off season. Um, so it's a little bit overgrown because it would grow through the summer. And uh, we were there in November, same time we are this, this part of the year right now. And um, as you walk through this place, we came to the very top of the tell to a place that he has identified as King Bera's palace. So this is it right at the top of the tell, and it's at the, the best profile where, where he put his palace, and he's going to tell us a little bit about it. This is a huge Middle Bronze Age palace, all this reddish uh, colored mud brick, called the Red Palace. Um, it's, all the walls were plastered. It, the height of this one wall is preserved higher than I can reach. Okay. Uh, so it's a massive palace. It goes all the way down to the edge of the tell, to the, to the rampart. You walked on it going all the way up. It, goes, it seems to go that direction, maybe 20 meters or so. So it's, the palace is maybe 40 meters by 40 meters, something like that. It sits right on the edge. It's Middle Bronze Age. It's got to be King Bear's Palace. If this is Sodom, that's King Bear's Palace. You can see why I put his palace right here. <coughs> Man, look, look what he's looking for. This is his kingdom. Well, look at the geography when we get to the other side. But this is it. <coughs> right down here, some of the plaster from the upper story. There was an upper story. This is floor plaster from the second story. So King Bear is probably tromping around on that floor. Okay. This is coming from up. Okay, there's pieces of it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is typical kind of uh, plaster. But the interesting thing about it is, feel that. That went through some heat. 
So, this is where we get all these hard <coughs> mud bricks that are fired like pottery coming from the upper stories of this palace. So obviously it got very hot when it burned and that was the end of the city. That was the end of the civilization for the next 700 years. So this is pretty exciting to me. King Vera's Palace, that's what I call it because I don't know what else you call it. So there you have it, there's the mud brick, and the interesting thing is he talks about the, uh, the pottery, or the, the, uh, the floor of King Beerus Palace. So you can see some of the mud brick there. We were there in the off season, this is 3,500 years old, so they've covered it up, all these black tarps everywhere, it's because it's not been exposed to any fresh air or water or anything like that in thousands of years, so they cover it so that it doesn't get destroyed. And you can see here, these are the mud bricks and there's, there's plaster on the wall. So if we just zoom in on that, you can see the mud brick construction at the back and then the plaster that's on the wall that he was talking about. Now, this is a piece of that wall plaster um, from the site and actually on the back of it, you can actually see where one of the mud bricks was indented into this because although we see all the mud bricks today, um, back in that day, they're like we are today, they don't just have studs and, and bricks on the walls, they would decorate them and they would plaster them over so that they would be all shining white buildings because that would be the veneer on top of whatever it was constructed out of. So that's one of those pieces of, of uh, the floor. That's actually the wall. The piece of pottery or uh, of uh, mud brick that he had that's on the, the plaster from the floor, this is actually one of those pieces, Brother Stan Isbell and I um, decided we would share it, so we busted it in two, and um, that's the, uh, the other side. I did ask permission, by the way, um, but like that's the, one of those pieces of plaster. So this is the very plaster from the floor of the palace in the city of Sodom that King Bera would have walked on, as he said, and Lot would have walked through as well. Now, granted, we're just going on hearsay so far. So let's just, just follow this through a little bit further and see if the evidence is a little bit more convincing. So here is the city itself that's being dug up. And um, you can see how they're digging right down into this area to get right deep into the, the area that was, that was down below. And you can see the mud brick construction there. There's mud bricks on the side there. And they're digging down into what would be the homes of the people who lived at this point in time. And again, they're able to identify the period of time based on the pottery that they're digging up and they're pulling out. And there's all kinds of pottery from this period. Here's a, uh, a bowl that they dug out and uh, they took it out and they cleaned it up and that's what it looks like. It's got this very uh, marked um, or specific drawing on the side of it. And um, we were able to bring home some of these pieces with us. This is a similar piece than the one that's there. And um, they have a water pot that they're digging out here right out of the ground. And uh, that water pot is being lifted very carefully. And this is right from the time period of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And all kinds of little cups and pots and whatever else. And this one here actually is like that, the one with the, the painting on the back of it. And that's one of the reasons why they know that this is the Middle Bronze Age time that dates right back to Abraham's time. is because the way these pots were made, the way that they were fired, how they were painted, and the things that were there. And you're quite welcome to come up and have a look at this stuff afterwards. Um, I'll remind you that, you know, what happened to the people in Sodom who uh, didn't live according to the law and uh, broke the commandments of stealing whatever else would happen to them. I'm not worried about anything walking away. So, um, but here's a little interesting thing. You know, these little pots and cups, and you just got to, when you're in a place like this, you got to think about this and say, look, this, this is a, from a cup, you know, or, or possibly something like that. You know, maybe somebody's teacup of the day or whatever they drank. And uh, now we don't know. I mean, but there was a whole ecclesia in this area. This could have been the cup that belonged to Lot himself, for all we know. Um, there's like a, a jug handle here from a, a larger jug. This would be a big water pot that they would have held onto, or maybe a big one with two sides. But these are all pots from their discard pile. And the discard pile, by the way, is, is huge. Like it's, it's about 12 meters in diameter and stands several meters high or feet high. Um, and it's all the stuff that they couldn't find mates to. But here's another handle to another cup as well. And uh, this is all there. It's all evidence. Because see, for the longest time, people turned around and said, well, the Bible's not true because the city of Sodom, like what a ridiculous story. How is that even possible? Um, it just can't be. 
But we have all this evidence that's laid out there. And there's all kinds of different stuff. And, and this is a, you can see the, the color of this pot. This is similar. This is from a, um, a serving dish or, or a, uh, a pot that would be used. And on the back, there is all this, this um, calcified or, or sand that's been crystallized that's stuck to the back of this pot. And the interesting thing is, is this is also uh, an Iron Age site. It dates to the Roman times as well. And they know what strata the Romans are on is because the Roman site has glazed pottery on it, like this little shard here. Um, that dates from a technology from a different period of time. This was spun on a wheel, and it has those bubbles in it, which are characteristic of something spun on a wheel. And you can see the marks where they've actually made this. This is both from the Roman time period. So those are the evidences that are there. So they knew this city was a, a city from the time period that they were looking for that was described in the Bible. And there's all kinds of different things that they pulled out of the ground. There's the bowl that's been excavated, and all tiny little things. This is a little perfume amulet that would be, you know, your sort of whatever it was, uh, you know, Chanel number no. five or something there like that of the day. Um, and these were all those little things that we would have in our houses, just the similar type of stuff that they would have that were destroyed at this point in time. And that's the pile we got it from, and again, we got permission to do that. So. Moving forward then, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, let's just flip the page over to chapter 14 in Genesis. Because here we have the next piece of the narrative. It's the battle of the kings, Kedileomer, um, who comes up from the south, and so, or comes from the north, sorry, from beyond Damascus. And uh, he travels all the way down to the south, to Ezion Geber, uh, to the, uh, the Paran wilderness. And he's down there from where he would get iron, not iron, sorry, brass from the, uh, the, the mines that have been found down by Alat. And then they travel back up to Hazazon Tamar, which we know as in Gedi, but it comes up as Hazazon Tamar in the Bible. And then past the Dead Sea, um, they came up, and of course there was a great conflagration in the battle against the kings of Sodom and the five kings that ally with him against the kings of the south. And of course, the kings of Sodom lose that battle, and um, they go up, they plunder Sodom, they take Lot captive, and they go all the way up uh, back to their own city. Now, what's interesting about this is in the narrative, um, it describes these slime pits. I don't know if you ever picked this up before. Genesis chapter 14, and verse 8, there went out the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zor, and they joined battle with them in the valley of Siddim. Right? So Siddim is the field or the plain. And of course, during this battle in verse 10, in the vale of Siddim, it was full of slime pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fell and f or fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. Well, as we're driving down towards Masada, this is that slime, or one of these slime pits that has appeared today, because the Sea of Gal or Sea of, of uh, the Dead Sea is at the same level it was back in the time of Abraham. It was much higher for many years, but it's back down to that same level. So what happens is, is that it erodes underneath, and um, this is that that exact sort of description of these slime pits that are found there. So the word slime in the uh, Strong's Concordance is kamar, which means to boil or foam, uh, to be reddened, to daub. And the idea is, as the uh, um, theodolo theological word book of the Old Testament says, it's cement, mortar, clay, um, the clay of the area, particularly Palestine. And a pit, of course, is simply a pit or a well. So that's the idea, and that is the slime pit there. So as we're driving down there, uh, Lane pointed out to us these, these pits along the way, and there's a sign there that says, danger, open pits. Because the problem is, the Israelis are a lot like us. You could go to a, a resort, and you could go and pay your you know, couple hundred shekels or whatever it is to go paddle in the Dead Sea and, and get all its mineral properties and whatever else. Or... You could just stop your car at the side of the road and walk out across uh, the land and hop in the Dead Sea for nothing. The problem is, is that these caverns have developed underneath a lot of this area and they just open up and people fall in them like the king of Sodom would have done. Of course, clothed with all kinds of armor and whatever else, it would have been really difficult to get out. So it's a very dangerous area. 
But when we look at this, we read in Genesis 11, verse 14, 11, they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their victuals and their supplies, basically, and went their way, and they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and they departed. Now, Abraham, back in his tent, um, in the area of Hebron at the time, in chapter 14, verse 14, heard his brother was taken captive. He arms his trained servants that were born in his own house, 318, and he chases after them even unto Dan. And so they went up into the north, the area of Dan, which is also called Laish, as we'll see later on, and they, they fought and they, they won, and they brought back, in verse 16, all the goods and his brother Lot and the goods, uh, his goods and the women also and the people. What is interesting, though, in this whole situation, of course, Abraham comes back and he meets uh, Melchizedek in Jerusalem and uh, the whole thing where the king of Sodom wants to pay him off and he says, not a chance. But when we look at that and we say that Abraham brought back all this stuff in Lot, what's interesting to notice about Lot is he did not join in the battle. He did not go with the king of Sodom to defend the society of Sodom against what was going on, which is very interesting. He hadn't participated. Uh, it just tells you a little bit about Lot. Even though he'd made some bad choices, here we find him remaining separate from what was going on. Well, fast forwarding then to the time when the angels arrive, and really it should have been sort of one of those notes to Sodom, like after he'd been taken away, he's reintroduced to Abraham. At that point in time, he sort of said, Abraham, never mind this, I'm coming with you. But he stayed. And brothers and sisters, how many times do we have to go through things like that in our own lives, where God maybe resets the clock for us, presses the reset button, and we're brought back to a situation where we should really stop and evaluate how did we get to this place and think about that and maybe make some changes. Well, Lot, unfortunately, just doesn't do that. So later on, we have the arrival of the angels because God has decided that this city is so wicked, it needs to be destroyed. And so we have then the, uh, the city and um, the angels come to the gate of the city. Well, this is where the gate complex is. There is usually one major gate in any city because of course you'd only want to defend one major entrance and it's been found in the lower area of the city chapter 19 verse 1 there came two angels to Sodom at even and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom Lot seeing them rose up to meet them bowed himself with his face towards the ground and so we know that there was a gatehouse so Brother Lane and Dr. Collins basically said, well, we've got to locate the gates because we know there's a gatehouse because it tells us there's a gatehouse. That's also how they knew that there was a wall around the whole city. And the first thing they started looking for was a rampart because it says if there's a gate, that means there has to be a wall. So if we could locate the wall, we could follow the wall around, we could probably locate the gate and that will help us figure out where everything else is in the city. Well, here is uh, Dr. Collins standing on top of the wall that they found. And um, they found some, some very distinctive gates. There's uh, Brother Lane, who has worked closely with Collins for years. So he got called in to help draw some of the uh, sketches of what this area would look like. And here's one of those sketches. They found this, this gate passage. And then there's this, this wall that had been put up that and during the Intermediate Bron Bronze Age, filling in this gate so it's it's like shutting the door rather than closing a door made out of wood during a time of siege they would actually build a wall in front of that area so that it was much more difficult to get in well that wall is still in existence today lot sat in the gate well here's one of the gates and there is dr collins there with this wall that has been blocked off um, during the intermediate bronze age and there you see it in the diagram that, that lane drew so they knew roughly where the gate of the city was, but this wasn't really the main gate, it was just a small passageway. Um, so they were looking for this main gate of the city, and they kind of had an idea roughly where it would have been based on the topography of the land. And Lane at the time did a bit of a diagram saying, well, it's got to be, we know roughly the age of it and what it would have looked like. And so they, they, he sketched up this idea of a second story, probably a couple of um, towers they could look down from to guard this gate to the city. Well, after we'd left, in the year 2012, the following year, they made a major discovery. 
and that was the gate complex. And this is an aerial shot of it, and this was just stuff that's recently been uh, published by Collins. I've had it for a little bit, but wasn't allowed to use it right away, only because he hadn't published it himself yet. So um, here's what it looked like. You can see the, the Middle Bronze Age city wall there, and um, then you have this whole gate complex and this, this tower that's in behind. And so they found, first of all, this little narrow passageway, um, and then they were sort of like, okay, we're, as we're digging here, this has to be the structure. And there was an outer wall, and there's a bench on the inside, and we'll talk more about city gates. And um, so they were pretty excited, but it was right at the very end of the season, and uh, they couldn't excavate. So they had to wait till the next year. So the 2013 season rolled around, and um, Lane joined them again and took his wife Kathleen with them. And so they were there kind of mapping out, knowing what they knew about the Middle Bronze Age cities, they kind of could say, this is roughly where we figure everything should be. So they planned it out and started digging, looking for this gate complex. And here's just a couple of shots of the archeologists as they dig down, there's these ropes they put across where they figure this roughly should be. And uh, they're measuring these stones and the walls figuring on this being the, the gate system. And then it came to light pretty quickly what they had come across. And it's pretty exciting because um, when you look at this, the whole story of the angels coming into the gate, there was only one gate of the city, so this is the place the angels would have come through. And what they've done, they, they've got these columns here, so we had people stand on the columns to kind of show you the structure of the gate. There's the outside wall. The two towers would have been here. There's a third tower over there. So your soldiers would have been way up high here, and this would have been the passageway, and then this would be where commerce would take place. So it's a very large room. They would have columns because in order to cover it, um, you had to have supports, just like we do today, uh, to span those distances. They didn't have the great big iron girders that we have today, so a house was decided on by the size of a tree that you could bring along, and that's how you would figure out how you were going to do it. So as this came to light, they realized that the initial drawing that they'd done, although accurate to a point, was just way underscaled, and this is really what it would have looked like. It was too massive towers on the outside, two smaller towers on the inside, and this would have been the gate complex. And um, there it is kind of juxtaposed, juxtaposed against the city wall in the area today. Well, Lot, of course, uh, took these visitors to his house, and he brought them to his door, and the door was shut. And one of the things that we came across on our walk there was this very interesting stone that's been carved out. And what it is, is it's a hinge stone. So back then, they didn't have iron, right? Because this is before the Iron Age. So to make a door turn, they would actually take a post, a big beam, and they would take that beam and they would hollow a rock out like this on the bottom, hollow a one out on the top. They would build that into the wall. They would put the beam into that. They'd put all animal fat. They would round the, the, uh, the beam out, all kinds of animal fat, grease the, the hinge, so to speak and uh, it would swing on this hinge, right? So that's how this would work. So that's the way the door structure was. So here we have a door post from the city. Was it Lot's door? Of course, we have no idea, but it could have been. Um, but that's the interesting thing. All the different elements that are talked about are there. Well, here are some, some houses from this area, uh, from this era. Uh, Genesis 19, verse three, um, Lot presses upon the angel's greatly and brings them into the house and makes a meal with them there. And while this is going on, um, Abraham is having a conversation with the angel that's left with him. Because remember, he's been told that they're going to go and destroy the city. And so he's wondering, well, what about the ecclesia that's in that city? Right? And you know the, the, par the, the, the narrative as it goes on. Um, Genesis chapter 18, uh, just over a page or two, if you got it, flip it open, because we'll look at this as our next text. And uh, verse 23, Abraham drew near and said, will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he starts off and he says, look, if there's 50 righteous within the city, you're going to destroy the city? And that tells you a little bit about Abraham. I mean, he's, he's a guy that's, that's very hopeful. But it also tells you about how big he figured the ecclesia must be. It had to be at least 50 people. And really, you do the math and you think, well, 
how, why would he come up with such a number? Well, the issue was this. If you remember back in Genesis 13, verse 5, there were, the land could not hold all of the servants and the people and the stuff that they had. Tents and flocks wasn't able to bear them because their substance was so great. Remember in chapter 14, when Abraham had come to rescue Lot, he'd taken 318 of his trained men that had grown up in his house. Well, if he had 318 men, for every man, usually, there's a wife and perhaps a child or two. But if he just said 318 men, add a wife, that's 600 and some. Add one child, that's 1,000 people in Abraham's entourage. Now, most of them had way more kids than he did. But you take that sort of set of numbers and say, okay, if Lot had an equally great substance, let's say he had half of that. Let's say there's 500 people in Lot's entourage. Abraham says, well, at least 10% of them must still form the ecclesia of Sodom because these were Bible believers. They'd left the land of Ur of the Chaldees because of the call of God. What reason was there for Lot to stay in Ur of the Chaldees? Every reason in the world. Remember what it says, and he, if they'd been mindful of the city, like where they were going or what else, they probably would have stayed. So the only reason Lot went, it was because he was faithful. He's called righteous Lot in the New Testament. But of course, the story goes on in Genesis chapter 18, verse 23. Abraham sort of, you know, it almost seems like negotiating with the angel. It's almost the incredulity of Abraham. He can't believe this. He says, well, what about if there's 45? He says, well, I wouldn't destroy if there was 45. 40? Uh, 30? 20? 10? And Abraham's realizing that the whole ecclesia of at least 50 people has fallen away. And we're down to less than 10 people at this point in time. And brothers and sisters, remember that. That's what dwelling in the wrong place can do to an ecclesia. It can just pull it apart and can destroy it. And that's what happened here. And so in Genesis chapter 19, if you just come back over to the page to chapter 19, when the angels come to Sodom, we read there in chapter 19, verse 12, the men said to Lot, have you here any beside? Sons-in-law. So, okay, that means he had daughters who were married, right? Have you uh, sons, daughters, whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. So you've got sons-in-law that were already married to his daughters. You've got sons... And you've got his daughters who weren't married yet. So this is, this is a family. If you've got sons-in-law, that means at least two daughters, because it's plural. Sons means at least two sons, because it's plural. And daughters means at least two daughters, because it's plural. So that's six kids, at least. Add Lot and his wife. There's eight, right? And possibly more, plus spouses and grandchildren and so on and so forth. He says, bring them out of the city. So Lot goes out and he speaks to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. And he says to them, up, oh, get out of this place, for Yahweh will destroy the city. But he just seemed like, you know, oh, Uncle Lot, here we go again. The father-in-law is going on. The Bible-thumping father-in-law that came from afar with all these visions of grandeur and all this belief in the Bible and Yahweh, the God of Abraham, and blah, 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 blah. We've heard it all before. Young people, sometimes that's our attitude. Mom and dad and going to meeting and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff, right? Remember this lesson. Because these young people fell away. They decided, ah, we're not doing this anymore. It's, you know, I'm better than that, or I got better stuff to do. It's not for me. And there's times in our lives where it isn't for us, because we're making wrong decisions. But don't ever think that that's where it needs to stay. God calls us out of this world. He deploys his troops, your parents, your uncles, your aunts, to bring you up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. He has invested the time of his servants in you. And the minute that you realize that I'm on the wrong track, God will be there to help you come back. And sometimes he has to redirect us through painful ways. But there's the story. He goes out and they just won't listen to him. Let's not be like that. And remember the lesson. 
This is, uh, I can't remember if this is the ESV or the NIV. It's one of the newer translations. But it says, be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. That's what had happened in Sodom. Bad company had corrupted the people that were there. And of course, they wouldn't come. And so God has to extract Lot from this place. Genesis 19, just over the page in verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then Yahweh rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire Yahweh from Yahweh out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that, and that which grew upon the ground. Peter puts it a little differently. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, he says, He turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example or an ensemble to all those that after should live ungodly. They are written down for an ensample for us. If we start living a lifestyle that's described here, this is what we can expect. So, Colin said, well, that being the case, what we should find when we dig up the city of Sodom, is ash. Now, this building here is constructed probably largely of timbers. Yeah, there'll be cinder blocks and whatever else, but there'll be a lot of tinders. And if we were to burn this to the ground, how much ash do you think there would be? Six inches? Maybe? If the whole thing went up in flames, maybe a foot? Okay. What about if you buried it for 3,500 years, how much ash do you think there would be left at that point in time? Inch or two, once it's all compressed down? Well, here's the interesting thing. In this city, there is one meter of ash. And you can see it right there. You can see that there, that's ash. That's not volcanic ash. They know what volcanic ash is. That what it's made up of is totally different than this. This is ash, and, and there's volcanoes all through this area. Uh, I didn't realize that, but we'll see that later on when we look at the other city. But there's volcanoes all over here. So it's a meter of ash in this area. That's a, a meter stick laid out, and you've got rocks here. This is where the Iron Age city was built over top of this meter of ash. And you can see how the strata of the land goes here, and there's the Iron Age city built on top. So there's the meter of ash, and wherever we went, you could see it. It was right there. You could put your hands in and you could pull some out and feel the ash in your very hands. And like I say, they built over top of it. Well, that's a very peculiar thing that you would build over ash. Usually you dig down to the bedrock and you build over top of the bedrock. But here, they built over top of this destruction layer in the later Iron Age, the time of, of Solomon and so on, and the Romans built over this layer of ash. And here's Dr. Collins describing it. The Middle Bronze Age houses are all over the surface. A, you can see the inside of the, of the MB City Wall Foundation. Okay. And there's a street. Oh, that's just the street that runs all along. But look down toward, look at that ash. Look at the piles of ash next to the city wall. That's the ash of the terminal destruction. It's right on the surface. Here, right there. You see that ash? Skeletons coming out here. This is ash all through. We have skeletons. This is the bone sticking out of this box right here. We're going this way. Now, did you guys hear what he said? Sticking out of the ash? Skeletons. Bones. Because again, he said, well, if this whole city was destroyed and the entire population wiped out in a moment, we should be able to find the bodies. Well, here they are. So here is uh, an archaeologist, and she is covering these, these bones because they've been buried for so long, they cover them in like an epoxy and enamel, so they don't just disintegrate, and you can see what she's doing there. And there is a bone from somebody from this period of time at the bottom of a layer of a meter of ash. And so there they are again, they're all over the place as they're digging through this area, bones sitting in the terminal area. And what is interesting, though, is that, you know, archaeologists from this time period, like, really, when you find bones, this is the way you would find them. You would find them in something called an ossuary, right? So if they were buried, right, they put the person in a tomb. It's kind of gross. The person rots away. They gather up the bones, and they put them in a little clay 
jar, sort of their square little coffin thing, called an ossuary. That's one way you would find bones. The other way you would find them is if they dug a hole and they just buried you in it because they didn't have time to do all of that or you weren't rich enough to have a little cave with an ossuary. They just dig a hole and bury you. So you would get a skeleton buried in the ground. If it was a siege time, usually you would find a bunch of skeletons all kind of stuffed together, all intact, maybe arrowheads and stuff like that, and cleaved skulls and whatever, and you would see the evidence of it. That's what they found at, at Masada. That's not what they found here. What they found here was what they call human bone scatter. Now, Collins was telling us, one of his team, they're all uh, volunteers, was a forensic doctor. And he said, this is the kind of thing that we would see, and he was from the army, um, with an explosion, where you would have fragments of bodies that are scattered all over the place. And that's what they found as they dug this whole area up. Not only that, but here's a leg, right? This is the, the bottom half of a leg. That's the femur at the top. This is the tibula and fibula. The tibia and fibula here, you actually two legs here, the, the legs together. But notice the toes. I if you can just take a, a look at that there. Those toes are what they call hyperflexed toes. Now, if anybody was at the gym with us on the weekend, on Friday night, somebody lobbed a frisbee in my general direction, and my peripheral vision is not very good because I'm kind of blind, and like, you know, I immediately, what do I do? I couch down and the toes flex up, bracing for the impact. Well, this body, this person, was dismembered with their toes hyperflexed. So at the instant that they were crouching for some kind of impact, their leg was blown off. And not only that, but the femur is charred. You can actually see it a little bit closer up. There's the bone scatter. We'll just blow up the femur there. And you can actually see how it's been burned off the end here. It's a charred femur. So, and then Colin says, okay, but that's all well and good, he says, but like, here's the interesting thing. Where's the rest of the body? And this is what they found all through this whole area. Site after site after site was these bones that had been blown to pieces, these bodies buried under one meter of ash. And if we weren't convinced that that was Sodom, to me, this was the turning point. Because as he pointed out to us, well then what caused this? You know, what is it possible to create a meter of non-volcanic ash burying a population that's been blown to smithereens. If it was a volcano, it would be like Pompeii. They dug it up, you can see how the bodies are, they're all encased, nothing like that. This was obliterated. So when you look at that, you also find the actual stones. Remember he was talking about the mud brick, the, uh, the palace floor, how that it was hard fired? 6,000 degrees Celsius is the temperature you would need to do that. And it's all through this whole area, this hard-fired mud brick, 6,000 degrees Celsius. And there's a roof. You can see the pattern of the, the straw that would have been laid, and they plastered over top of that. Hard-fired and infused with sulfur. Not only that, but he found this really odd thing. This is a shard of pottery here, um, Middle Bronze Age pottery from Tel Al Hammam. And um, he sent it to the uh, University of Nevada and said, look, can you tell me what this is? And they said, oh, that's no problem. That's Trinitite. It's from the Nevada desert where they set off the nuclear bombs and did their tests. It's called desert glass. And he said, turn it over. And they turned it over, and it's a pot from the Middle Bronze Age. And so here you have a temperature that took the sand in the desert and turned it into glass as it cooked against this. And it's found all the way throughout desert glass. This was four kilometers southwest of the Tel al-Hammam site. So that's the evidence that's given to us in Genesis chapter 19. We read about it. Yahweh rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven, and overthrew those cities of the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and everything that grew on the ground. But we end our class, brothers and sisters and young people, with just a little sober reminder. It's what the Lord Jesus Christ says in Luke, right? He tells us to remember Lot's wife. Just think about this for a moment. What was the situation in Sodom? What was the problem? Ezekiel 16 tells us. We think of just immorality. Well, that's last on the list. It starts off in verse 49. This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Ezekiel 16, 49. Pride. That's number one. 
fullness of bread, the abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. That's what we're told. And it, it tells us that, you know, the Lord points out in Luke 17, he says, look, likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But in the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he, shall, he that is on the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. He that is in the field, let him not likewise return. Remember Lot's wife. You see, brothers and sisters, just, I don't know if you've ever read this and thought about this. Genesis 19, verse 15. When the morning arose, and the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed with the iniquity of the city. It says, he lingered for a while. And the men grabbed hold of his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the hand of his two daughters, Yahweh being merciful unto him, and brought them forth and set them outside the city. Why? Why did God have to have his angels drag them out of the city? Why would Lot's wife then, after that, turn and look back? For the longest time, I thought, you know, it's probably all the, uh, you know, maybe she had some Egyptian... Um, decorations in the house and, and pots and stuff from, from, you know, who knows where, Cyprus or something, some fancy stuff. And that's the way I used to think about it until I stopped and thought, wait a minute. He had daughters who had married sons who probably had families. And if you're a grandmother, how would you feel if your grandchildren are about to be consumed in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it just totally changed the way I thought about Lot's wife. But you see, brothers and sisters, this is the issue. If we're worried about that kind of thing, now is the time to make those interventions. Now is the time to get involved. Ask the question, if the angels were to come for us today, what would hold us back? When well, you look at ancient civilization, and you know what? They had these huge colosseums. Not in Sodom per se, but Rome certainly did. Well, so do we. We have colosseums. We're not really any different than they are. They had their arenas where they played their games. Well, so do we. And we have our gods as well hanging in the flags above the arenas. They had their theaters. This is the theater of Ephesus. You know what it's called? The Odeon Theater. Um, we have our theaters as well. The logo for Cineplex Odeon is taken from the structure of Ephesus. And so if we think we're better than them, we're no better. And kids, Pick up the secret little message that's hidden in this. It's called a cinema, right? You go to the cinema, and that's where there's a lot of sin portrayed upon the walls of these places. Remember that little song we sing in Sunday school, be careful little eyes what you see. Because if you put Sodom into your brain, it becomes part of your heart. And when it's time to leave, you don't want to go. Ask yourself on a Sunday morning, when it's time to go to meeting, what holds you back? I just got to finish this game, you know. Forget it. Get on with what matters because the Lord is coming, the kingdom is coming, and we can't be held back by these things. Well, they had their entertainment. They had their drink as well. So do we. Pots are all dug up. They had their love of money. Right? You've got one right here in North Battleford. So do we. And remember the secret message. It's a casino, right? This is the stuff that's all out there for us. The city I live in is Brantford. Now, we're a ways away from Toronto, about a hundred, uh, well, about an hour or so outside of Toronto. In, in my own neighborhood is where they put this store. 
and its name, Sin City. All the pornography and wickedness that you want to get. And what's even worse than that, it's as it was in the days of Lot. Sundays, just in case you're thinking of being a little religious, it's two for one day. So you can sin twice as much on a Sunday, and it'll cost you less. But the price is the same. The price is death. And that's the world that we live in. But you know what? You don't even have to go out of your own house. You can just see what's around you. It's one of my favorite little cartoons. And it says it all, doesn't it? Pander to me. The world sees it, but sometimes we just don't figure it out. And see, the thing is, is Sodom is described in Jude as a place where they gave themselves over to fornication, verse 7. Going after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The word for fornication in the Greek is ek porneo. The lust or glut that satisfies itself completely. And brethren, sisters, and young people, that was destroyed in Sodom. And it's just one click away for every single one of us. And so, if we're struggling with this kind of thing ever, remember the sin of Sodom. Just unplug it. Forget shutting it down, just unplug it from the wall. Who cares if it crashes your machine? Probably better take a sledgehammer to it anyway. But get the thing out of our minds and out of our hearts. And young people, if you're struggling with this, talk to your parents. It's an issue that is going all over the world. It's in all the schools. It's in all the different societies we work in. It's in our ecclesias as well. Do not get swallowed up in the sin of Sodom because we're told it's an ensample to us. God made them an ensample to all those who should after live ungodly. And there was just Lot. But what God did was he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation or lifestyle of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. But the Lord knew how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to receive, reserve the unjust in the day of judgment to be punished. God can deliver us, but we've got to turn to him. So the lesson for us, brothers and sisters, is to remember Lot's wife and also his children. Let's not be like them, swallowed up in the iniquity of the world that we live in, but let us hold on to the promises to Abraham and not leave in Abraham's side to go to the well-watered plains, but hold fast to our ecclesia, to our brothers and sisters, and make that conscious decision that when the Lord returns, we want to be with him. And when the angel comes and knocks at the door, we're not worried about what's in the house. Drop it all, and we're ready and eager to go. That's the lesson for us of Sodom.